The trip was supposed to be a chance to disconnect and recharge far from civilization, cell phone towers, and billable hours. An opportunity to take a stock of my life in the quiet splendor of nature, while reconnecting with old friends. Well, if nothing else, I've certainly had plenty of time to take stock. Calling the impetus for this trip a midlife crisis doesn't feel entirely accurate, both because I'm not yet middle-aged and because a gripping term like crisis seems entirely too exciting. Perhaps a quarter life on we is the right term. I had been in the workforce post-law school for three years and had begun to see the rest of my life stretch out before me in a never-ending array of conference calls, memos, and corporate compliance agreements. What truly inspired the trip, I suppose, was not the realization that the prospect of 40 more years spent in the trenches of corporate law was unacceptably bleak, but that I was coming to accept it wouldn't be so bad really. A comfortable life, a privileged life in many respects, it felt like the moment the biting wind fades away, the cold snow becomes a warm blanket, and one teeters on the edge of acceptance, recognizing that freezing to death might not be so bad after all. I'm aware that thinking of my cushy corporate job as a metaphor for freezing to death is pretty ironic, and given that there's a pretty good chance now that I will actually freeze to death. I suppose that I could laugh at it if, you know... I wasn't worried about freezing to death, or worse. I think maybe I have not yet had the inordinate amount of whiskey I need before I'm ready to think about that, or worse. The sky was a gunmetal blue when we crossed over the state line into Kittery. By the time that we hit Somerset County, two and a half hours north of 195, it had shifted to a steely gray, the clouds hanging low and depressive. The first flakes began to fall in Dexter, where we stopped to load up on groceries, beer, and to final impulse buys at the arenas located within the heart of downtown, surrounded by empty brick buildings and boarded up businesses. I had lived 18 years of my life in Somerset County, and had spent too many cold hours as a teenager, sitting in a car lodged on the side of the road waiting for rescue, to think casually, given the nature of our destination of continuing on in a snowstorm. But the forecast hadn't called for any snow, and we figured any flurries would assume that up. We were heading deep into the north main woods. Jason's family had some ancestral mansion located well within the unorganized territory, a perfect spot according to him, for a week of ice fishing and day drinking. The appeal of dropping off the face of the world and spending a week in one of the few areas of the country still largely unmapped, where the places were not given names but numbers, held a deep appeal to me, and apparently to Jason as well. Jason and I had gone to high school together and now worked at the same boutique patent law firm in D.C. We had somehow convinced our friends, scattered about the United States and a great diaspora common to Maine college graduates, that a week in a secluded house in the main woods in January would be both fun and an ideal reunion experience. The snow stayed light and intermittent until we turned off the narrow two-lane blacktop road and onto the gravelly choked confines of the old logging road that led to the house. Our small caravan of cars had to slow to a creep, 4x4 driving gauged and headlights throwing back a screen of darting white static in the darkening evening as the snow, curiously unmentioned by the weather forecast on Wabi TV 5 the prior evening, picked up. We discussed turning back, trying again the next day. None of us wanted to risk going off the road this far from emergency services, our reliable cellular reception, but decided to press on. I found myself replaying that moment incessantly in my head. Imagining the life that I'd been living if we had gone through the onerous process of turning around on the small one-lane road, driving out of the woods, and turned our headlights south. I picture the alternative me, sitting in a motel room somewhere south and east, maybe in Greenville or Dover Foxcroft, probably feeling pretty discouraged that the trip had fallen apart and trying to figure out a new plan. 
but sitting in a place with electricity and central heating. Not trapped in a dark, crumbling mansion, hemmed in by shrieking winds and endless, remorseless snow. Shrieking winds that, sometimes at night mostly, when the thoughts in my head began to feel less like my physiological process, at least somewhat under my control, and more like starving rats skittering in Klein in panic, sound like the scratching of claws against wood and the chittering of unspeakable creatures waiting to feed. But we didn't turn back. We pressed on through the snow. The effort of keeping the car within the poorly defined boundaries of what was barely a road required immense concentration, making each tense moment stretch out. But the unchanging nature of the view, restricted to the narrow window of light able to cut through the swirling snow, lent the drive an eerily timeless quality. We were driving in silence, the only sound the swish of the wipers and the growl of the engine, when an object slammed against the car with a reverberating crash. More crashes followed in quick succession, and I saw a deer leap out of the gloom, its eyes highlighted by the glare of the headlights, were wide and swiveling wildly within the sockets, foam billowing from the corners of its mouth. It landed with a wrenching smash in the hood, and hooves began beating a staccato drumbeat, splintering the windshield. The animal writhed furiously and I saw panic in its eyes, as it finally got free and hurled itself away, running headlong in the direction that we had come. More deer and other small animals, their eyes ablaze in the light, darted past, running in outright panic, heedless of our cars as if fleeing a fire or a predator nipping at their heels. And then they were past us and all was silent again. <laughs> well, that was strange, drawled Ramesh. Are all the animals in this state that weird? We drove on. After a seemingly immeasurable period of time spent peering through the windshield into a landscape of white static, knuckles white at the wheel, the house came into view. It revealed itself slowly out of the darkness. A black wooden form nestled against the dark outline of a cliff, flanked by tall pines. Jason was unaware of when exactly the house was built, apparently sometime in the late 19th century, at the behest of his rather eccentric great-grandfather, Alicia Chamberlain, a lumber magnate whose vast fortune had long since been squandered by dissolute family members, bequeathing to Jason's parents only this last Ozymandiac monument to his wealth. The local lore was that old Alicia had experienced great difficulty in hiring crews to construct this palace in the North Woods. Apparently, the great untamed forest had so terrified the mildly band of French Canadians, Irish emigrants, and urban war chorus volunteers, employed to hew wood and haul baroque furniture through miles of rocky country and up the turbulent waterways that they quit faster than they could be hired. Many simply disappeared, walking off the job without even picking up last paychecks, melting away like smoke into the pines. Alicia, a man who had amassed an inordinate amount of money by underpaying workers, ruthlessly extinguishing business rivals, and exploiting the earth's resources, had, like many of today's moguls, conveniently waited until after he stood alone and unchallenged atop his empire of wealth to develop a conscience and devote himself to improving the morals of the common man. To that end, the old lumber magnate had apparently had great plans to build, a new Jerusalem in the main woods, a utopia where society could be reborn, free from corrupting influences. Unfortunately, soon after the completion of his mansion, intended to be a cornerstone of this new shining city in the woods. Alicia, like his workers before him, simply disappeared into the silent evergreens, and the whole project collapsed. A whole host of folktales came from the abortive attempt, with the few workers who did not simply walk off the job without a trace, telling of strange sounds and dark supernatural creatures that hunted at night. The verdict of a book, written by a professor from the University of Maine, Farmington, who collected and cataloged tales of local Maine folklore, was that these supernatural tales and mass disappearances were likely the relatively common, 
result of those unfamiliar with the main woods spending dark nights in unfamiliar territory and hearing the admittedly terrifying cries of ordinary local animals, such as loons and wildcats. Stephen's jeep slid to a halt in a spray of snow and gravel. The headlights threw the front of the wooden structure into sharp relief against the blackness, revealing dark and rotted steps crawling up to a cavernous set of double wooden doors. The house was rectangular and folded into a seam against the dark cliff that rose above it. It looked somewhat like a stately 18th century New England church had been airlifted from the center of a tiny small town and dropped unceremoniously, left forgotten in the wilderness to age and warp with the changing seasons. The slam of car doors sounded faintly through the blowing wind, and we paused briefly in front of the towering structure, our shadows cast high and long by the bright headlights, before rushing to get inside out of the cold. The unexpected snowstorm and the weird behavior of the animals had spooked me. I had been living in D.C. since I had left for law school, and had forgotten how helpless one could feel in the face of a powerful main blizzard. But with the heat of a fire crackling in the fireplace, its light amplified by strategically placed kerosene lanterns, the warm burn and comforting glow of several whiskey drinks resting in my stomach, and these sounds of laughter and chatter as we planned out our next few days, drowning out the whine of the wind, I began to relax. I struggled to sleep that night, recalling how the black heft of the cliff seemed almost to shimmer and vibrate against the sky when we had arrived. How the shadows of the trees in our headlights stretched contorted and deformed across the frosty white ground. The wind howled outside. It felt like... Like something unnatural in this place was tearing at the fabric of reality, drying it tight like the skin on a drum. The snow continued the next day. Several feet had fallen overnight, and I had to throw my weight against the heavy wooden door in the morning in order to open it against the press. I watched blurrily, more than a little hungover, as the snow which had drifted against the door collapsed inward into the house. It fell to the ground with a light woomph, seeming to spread out over the scuffed floor almost hungrily, as if eager to get inside. I stumbled to the side of the house and rested against the rough bark of a towering pine to relieve myself, watching my breath leave in great white plumes. The mansion was placed in a high point, and the land around it fell away sharply. The clouds hung low and dark in the sky, restricting the view, but I could feel the presence of the thick, undeveloped woods spilling away in all directions. I could hear the low roar of the river below, pounding its way through the narrow defile formed between the steep and snow-covered cliffs on either side. When I went back inside, Ramesh was puttering around and making breakfast on the portable gas grill that we had packed. He flashed me a smile and tanned me a Baxter IPA from a cooler propped open near the grill. Try some hair of the dog that bit you, bud. He droned in a ridiculously awful attempt at a thick Maine accent. I groaned and swatted it away. Ram, I'm not 21 anymore. I need some aspirin, some water, and a nap. I fell heavily onto one of the camp chairs that we had brought. The furniture left in the old house had largely been sold and what did remain looked dangerously fragile and smelled of faintly of decay. I felt tired, old, and vaguely depressed. I wondered briefly what I had been thinking when Jason and I dreamed up this plan after one too many after-work beers, both in that euphoric state between buzzed and drunk where every idea seems stupendous. Did I really think that coming to this old, decrepit mansion in the middle of nowhere would be some kind of enlightening, eat, pray, love moment. Instead, I was still depressed and at a loss with what I should do with my life. Only now, I was depressed in a musty mansion without electricity or running water, instead of in my cozy studio in D.C. These morose and okay pathetically self-pitying thoughts were interrupted when Stephen upended my chair, spilling me unceremoniously onto the floor. Let's carpe the shit out of this DM, my dudes. 
Ted, who out of all of us was the only one who had remained firmly in place in Somerset County. Opening an extremely successful construction business in Skowagan, had brought his snowmobile trailer along. True Blue, a central manor that he was, he had brought along enough snowmobiles for all of us to ride if doubled up. He drove first, breaking the trail, with Josh sitting behind him shouting directions. It took nearly an hour to make it through the still falling snow to the frozen lake at the foothills of the ridge. Jason had sworn up and down that long repeated family lore attested that this lake had the best ice fishing in the entire state. Given that, it had only belatedly come to our attention that nobody in his immediate family had even been to this mansion since his grandfather had passed. It was less the palatial manor we had been expecting, and more of a creepy old dump. I had begun to grow skeptical of his claim. However, I had to admit that on this point he had not been exaggerating, and soon an array of trout, perches, pikes, and other fish I couldn't name lay stretched out on the ice. Somehow I had forgotten that ice fishing was largely just standing around a hole in the ice, drinking and waiting. It soon lost its charm. With the snow still picking up, we elected to head back early. I was turning to follow Alex back to the waiting snowmobiles when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move. Turning slowly in my thick winter clothes, the snow sticking heavily to my boots, I looked in the direction of the movement. Something black and impossibly large moved unctuously underneath the surface of the ice, visible where we had cleared the snow. I heard a low scraping sound as its many limbs brushed against the surface. I felt my pulse sounding within the confines of my hat and hood. My mouth seemed suddenly very dry. I heard a low, guttural roar come reverberating out of the impenetrable white snow and let out a short, involuntary scream. Alex turned back to me, feeling a bit jumpy, Cade. I realized that the roar that I had heard was the snowmobile's engine kicking into life and let out a wheezy laugh. I guess I was feeling a little jumpy, imagining things. The falling snow pressed in on all sides, the heavy flakes cutting visibility down to a narrow sphere, beyond which it felt any number of things could be lurking just out of sight. Alex had one too many slugs of Jim Beam on the ice, so I'd drive on the way back. The heavy white pellets bit into faces and exposed skin and forced us to move slowly to avoid toppling into a ravine or hitting a tree. The snowmobile felt unwieldy beneath me, its thick bulk sluggish and slow to respond. I hadn't owned a snowmobile growing up, and had only ever driven them when visiting friends. I had always felt unreasonably jealous of those friends who were gifted snowmobiles for Christmas or for birthdays. To me, owning a snowmobile or an ATV the other ambiguous central main status symbol, had it been a testament to wealth and privilege. It was only when I had left Maine and went to law school that I realized that these markers of wealth were not seen as such by my classmates, that these people probably looked down on such middle-class toys, that there existed wealth and privilege on a scale I had not previously imagined. When the hulking shape of the mansion emerged out of the softly falling snow, I felt relieved. On the drive, I kept seeing, or imagining I saw, images of dark shapes flitting between the trees. Something or somethings, keeping pace with us and eyeing us hungrily. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up, and I felt a cold sweat break out despite the chill. When we had opened the door, we saw that snow carpeted the floor and our belongings. It must have blown in through the gaps in the wall said Alex, sounding more confident than he felt. We didn't speak much as we quickly swept it out. I tried not to notice how it seemed to resist being pushed out, how the white material seemed to move in ways inconsistent with the wind, as if eager to wrap around our warm bodies. That night, we were all a bit subdued. It was dawning on us that pressing on through the snow had been an extremely stupid decision. The small old logging road leading to the house was undoubtedly not plowed by anyone. And the snow was already too deep to make it back out by car. 
We anxiously listened to the weather report that came in intermittently through sharp bursts of static on Ted's portable radio. It was difficult to make out, but we all distinctly heard the weather report on 92.3 say. Expect the clear skies across the state to continue for the next few days. What the hell? Ram burst out in frustration. Did telling weather by satellite not yet replace reading bird entrails in this sorry state? It's a full-on blizzard out there. He gesticulated wildly toward the heavy stained glass windows that lined the walls, snow sticking eagerly, almost greedily to their panes. The sun had not yet fallen, but it was dark in the house. The thick blanket of snow allowing only a meager gray light to filter through. Maybe it's very localized, said Ted hesitantly. They may not bother mentioning a small storm out here where hardly anyone lives. Yeah, maybe, I agree, but it's still weird. We checked the weather so many times before coming. The satellite showed nothing for the next few days, not even scattered clouds. Where did this come from? Nobody had a good answer, and we all went to sleep shortly after. Now, I'm lying here trying to convince myself that these scratching and scurrying sounds against the roof and walls are just branches blowing in the wind. That the snow I keep needing to brush off my sleeping bag is just falling randomly through small gaps in the ceiling, not seeking me out. I started writing this account today. I'm not really sure why. Part boredom, part a slow creeping suspicion that something very odd is going on. This place just doesn't feel right. I remember now a weird story recently made the rounds about a small coastal main town, Malsumis, that was abandoned by its residents. I find myself wondering if perhaps there are still unexplored corners of this world, unturned rocks where things darken inexplicable fester. I think tomorrow we will try to figure out the best way out of here. We are all going to die in this place. We tried to make it out today. We didn't make it 500 yards before they started coming out of the snow. The morning broke with pale light filtering through the granite at great clouds. The snow hadn't let up. Ted's massive truck was buried almost above the hood, and the roofs of our various rented SUVs were barely visible. None of us had brought snowshoes other than Ramesh, who had insisted, much to our decision, and stopping in Freeport to pick up a pair of sticker new bright orange snowshoes from L.L. Bean. We elected to ride these snowmobiles back to the main road and deal with our cars and other gear later. We all paused before heaving open the heavy double doors, a team effort due to the accumulated snow. I think that all of us had the same unspoken, irrational fear of stepping out into the whirling blanket of snow, but were unwilling to give voice to it. It was an instinctual fear, as if coming from some long dormant reptilian section of the brain, attuned to an ancient threat. A threat long banished since we learned to wield fire and bend the world to our will, but the one that still lay in wait in the dark recesses of the world. The snow was falling heavily as we pulled away from the mansion. The broken slats leading up to the door lent the building an imbecilic broken smile, as if it watched us leave with manic derision knowing we would be back. I was driving behind Ted and Alex, the snowmobile's single headlight and despite the morning hour, as heavy snow pressed in claustrophobically. Blocking the sun and shrouding the tops of the trees in an impenetrable white swarm of flakes. The roar of the engines was loud, and the tang of gasoline strong in the air as we slid onto the open powder of the road and began to gain speed. I could barely make out Alex's form hunched behind Ted, holding on tightly, but still clearly saw what happened. I saw a black, shadowy form detach itself from a nearby tree and swoop in a fluid moment, almost too fast to follow toward Alex. The thing's eyes glowed red and gleaming teeth sprung at all angles from its mouth. Alex was knocked off the snowmobile in a single blow, and sprawled heavily at the foot of a tree. Blood splattered a pollock-like across the snow, 
words quickly dissipated as if greedily devoured. Alex began to scream. It sounded unlike anything I had ever heard, high-pitched and inhuman. We rolled over and started to crawl away from the creature, unfolding and standing tall above him. It towered nearly as tall as the trees. Dark black spikes were arranged along its back and they twitched as if in anticipation. I sat frozen in my seat, watching in numb horror as Alex pulled himself forward frantically on his arms and legs, looking back in fear. Blood still spurted from the claw marks across his chest and disappeared quickly into the heavy snow. White chittering, spider-like creatures descended soundlessly from the trees above and landed on Alex. More crawled from behind the trees, their many pale blue eyes swiveling wildly on stalks. Alex screamed briefly, and then was silent. Ted appeared out of the snow at his side, his eyes wide and his jaw clamped tight. He raised a small handheld axe high and brought it down on one of the chittering creatures, noisily feasting on Alex. It screeched, an inhuman piercing noise that made my ears ring. My paralysis broken, I swung off the snowmobile, its engine growling in neutral and ran toward them. Communication between my brain and body seemed to have broken down in some fundamental way, and my legs collapsed beneath me, sending me heavily into the packed snow. It seemed to move beneath me, cold and eager, and I let out a wordless groan of revulsion. Stephen and Jason were running toward Ted and the red, broken remains of Alex. A loud thud reverberated through the woods, shifting pottery snow from the green pine branches and I saw a many-toed leg strike the ground next to me. The creature towered above the trees, its upper half lost within the falling snow, an unthinkably large claw-like appendage, encased in a blue light shell, swept down from above and neatly cut Stephen in two, leaving his bottom half to stagger around for a few awkward steps before collapsing gracelessly into the snow in a spray of red. We all turned to run in unthinking panic, the snowmobile had died while waiting in neutral and I frantically fumbled with my thick gloves, trying to work the pull start engine. I could see out of the corner of my eye the black shadow like creature stalking me, languidly through the trees, its red eyes smoldering. The engine caught with a roar and I pulled the gas lever before fully on board, the machine jerking away in a spray of snow, nearly clipping a tree and overturning before I righted myself on it and sped back toward the house. Ted was ahead of me, the spray from his spinning treads splattering against the frame of my snowmobile. Suddenly, he was twisting in the air, his snowmobile skewing off the road without him as he struggled, ensnared in almost invisible twines of white that stretched across the road, cutting off our retreat. Thin ribbons of blood poured down his body as he struggled in the trap and the strands cut into him. The chittering white spider creatures swarmed out from the surrounding trees, and his screams were cut short. In the few seconds within which I saw this happen, I yanked my snowmobile to the right, smashing my knee painfully against the hard bark of a pine tree, and skidded crazily around the web and back onto the road. Jason and Ramesh followed closely behind me, sharing a sled together. I threw myself off the snowmobile letting it continue on to slam into the side of Ted's nearly buried truck and pelted up the broken stairs, feeling imagined grasping claws and teeth nip at my heels. Ramesh, Jason, and I burst through the heavy doors, swinging them shut with a satisfying thud behind us. And then it was deathly quiet. The only sound our heavy ragged gasp as we caught our breath. Jason was crying quietly, we waited to see if the creatures would follow us into the shelter of the house, making an end of it, but they did not. It continued to snow all day, and I can tell by the fading light that it's almost night. These scraping, chittering sounds are almost a constant now, with the occasional loud thud of impossibly large footsteps reverberating through the mansion. I feel like a mouse trapped in a hole listening to the swishing tail of a cat that may soon tire of the game and strike out of boredom. Jason hasn't spoken since we got inside. I think something deep within him might have broken. 
He is only sat cross-legged in the middle of the building, as far from the sifting snow as possible, rocking back and forth. I think my mind may go at any minute too. It feels like my sanity is being held together by a fraying rope, and when the last few strands go, I will drop into the darkness below. It might be a relief. My mind has dived into two Cades. One Cade has accepted what he saw. That creatures from a nightmare are waiting outside in the snow and is desperately trying to think of a way to safety. The other Cade knows that things like this simply don't exist. That the likely explanation is I suffered some type of mental breakdown and I'm locked in a padded room somewhere, being watched over by serious looking people in white coats scribbling down progress notes on thick pads. I hope the second kid is right, but I can feel the cold inside of my bones. I can taste the blood in my mouth from where I bit my tongue. I can smell the ancient, rank smell of creatures and out of this world. We need to find a way out. I tried to talk to Jason, but he merely laughed wildly. His eyes are bright and large in the gathering doom. The snow... He whispered softly, forcing me to bend down to hear him, smelling the damp sweat and terror radiating off of him, seeing these spittle-flecked lips tremble. It's like we're bugs in a Venus flytrap. It waited for us to get too far in, and then it closed the snow around us. We can't get out. We won't get out. It's just waiting. He giggled again and I couldn't get any more intelligible words out of him. Ram is pale, his lips bloody from worry gnawing, but he has gathered together all the tools that could be used as weapons and is methodically sifting through our gear. I think if we can survive this night, he and I will try to escape in the morning. I just hope this is only here. I hope this isn't the whole world now. I don't know the point of even trying to post this, aside from a few intermittent flashes. I've only had a sporadic service since leaving Greenville. Maybe somehow it'll go through though. At times, the connection comes through loud and clear despite the distance. I'll leave it trying to connect overnight. If you read this, just know that there are pockets in this world where reality is stretched thin, where things can come through. Stay away from them.